Welcome to the Science of Academic Success. This is the second half of a two-part video where we are discussing how to apply the science of learning to maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of our own studying. Make sure you've watched part one first because now we're going to build on top of that material. At the end of part one, we were discussing the SQ3R technique for studying, and embedded within this framework were a few key factors that I now want to expand on, because the research indicates that these specific behaviors have the potential to positively impact our studying. So let's discuss how to implement these techniques to make our own studying more efficient and effective. The first one is structure building. This is useful in the initial survey skimming part of our studying. That's the S from the SQ3R. But this is also something we should be doing as we are creating our study notes. Structure building involves developing a mental model or a representation of a concept where we integrate knowledge that had been presented at different times and across different sources. For example, when a concept is presented in class and then additional information is presented in the textbook. A 2016 study by Kathleen Arnold and colleagues found that this ability to create mental models, structure building, was a unique predictor of academic success. The key here is that rather than just studying a big mass of information, we incorporate an examination of the different ways the various pieces of information are related to each other. And we're using these relationships to help us create a structure, a system for putting all this information together. In just a moment, I'm going to demonstrate how to use structure building to make our studying more effective. But to really make this useful for you, I first want to connect structure building to another effective study technique, concept mapping. In a really interesting 2015 study, Leopold and Lutner examined different factors that improved the efficacy of our studying behaviors. They examined how the use of concept maps, visualizations, and metacognitive strategies impacted the effectiveness of our studying. In their research, they also had a comparison group where the participants studied by highlighting or underlining the material. Neither of those methods were effective, so we'll just focus on the effective techniques. Concept mapping involves drawing a concept map or a flow chart, focusing on relevant concepts and also the nature of the interconnections between those concepts. Visualizations involve transforming the written text into pictorial or graphic format, representing the concept in images, which gets us to focus on the meaning of the idea rather than specifically focusing on trying to memorize the original wording as it was presented in the text. In this study, Leopold and Lunar also examined the impact of using a metacognitive self-regulation strategy. This means we're observing our own studying behaviors, engaging in self-observation and self-assessment to help us plan our learning strategy, monitor the effectiveness of our learning strategy, and regulate or control our strategy by making appropriate changes when necessary. Applying this to concept mapping means that we would be evaluating whether we have successfully identified the core concepts and whether our concept map correctly indicates the nature of the relations between the concepts. Applying metacognitive self-regulation to a visualizing strategy means that we would assess whether our pictogram was successfully communicating or representing the nature of the concept and what elements needed to be modified in order to better represent the idea and the relations between ideas. To sum up their results, when combined with this metacognitive self-regulation, either concept mapping or visualizing were effective study strategies. This is all consistent with a 2013 study by Stephen Bax, which demonstrated that using metacognitive strategies while reading led to faster and more effective reading. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, if you want to make your studying efforts as effective as possible, then you need to engage in metacognition while you're studying. While reading, be mindful of what is being presented, the nature of the information, as well as how the information is connected to other parts of the material, the nature of the relationships between ideas. So ask yourself, what is being presented? If this information is a main idea or a fact, uh, is this information an elaboration or application of an earlier idea? Maybe it's a passage that explains or extends some earlier fact. Uh, is this information in some sort of sequence? Maybe this passage is describing a set of steps or a series of events. Is this information describing a hierarchy? Maybe the passage is describing a classification system or grouping ideas into categories. Uh, 
Uh, is this information describing relationships between ideas? For example, the passage might be comparing or contrasting concepts. Being mindful of the nature of the information will help us master the concept we're studying. It allows us to put the ideas into context with all of the other information we're learning. Metacognitive studying also involves being mindful of our progress. This means that while we're studying, we should observe whether we are successfully able to recognize the main point, understand the idea being presented, and identify the relationships between the ideas. This also involves observing whether we are making reading errors, uh, so i.e. having to go back and reread a passage for clarification, uh, or to correct an earlier reading error where we may have misread a particular word. If we are having difficulties, then we may need to recognize that this is a difficult section and may require more effort and care as well as additional time and review. If we are making extra mistakes, then we may be tired or distracted and may need to take a break or remove the distractors. You may need to practice using metacognition while you're studying, but getting in the habit of using metacognition while studying will make your studying efforts more efficient and effective. Okay, so everything we've been discussing so far has been bringing us here to this point. Let's return to the idea of concept mapping and let's discuss how to use this to make our studying more effective. So obviously we're reading and studying the course material and we're making our study notes. We talked about reading and creating study notes in the first part of this video. Uh, now to make our studying more effective, we want to add in concept mapping, which means that while reading and specifically in your study notes, you want to identify and make note of the nature of the relations among the ideas. So here are some examples. We can use a part of link to indicate a hierarchy structure in the concepts. In the example here, the concept in the higher layer of the map is composed of three factors, part one, part two, part three, indicated by P1, P2, P3. The concepts in the lower layer are parts or components of the higher order concept. In this example, this personality construct has three factors or three parts. The key here is that once you get accustomed to mapping out your study notes in this sort of format, it becomes a quick way to represent additional layers of information in your notes, sort of a shorthand way for coding information in your study notes. We can use a type of link to indicate different instances that fall within a higher order category. The concept in the higher layer represents a class and the concepts in the lower layer are different members of that category. In the example here, we can see that there are five different types of schedules of reinforcement. Each different type of schedule falls within the larger category. We can use a leads to link to indicate a sequence or chain of events where one concept leads to or results in another concept. In the example here, we can see that an initial event will have two outcomes. We can use an example link to show that we're providing an illustration or application of the higher order concept. In the example shown here, we have the concept of negative reinforcement, and we see that the second part is providing an example of that concept. And finally, we can use an evidence link to indicate that the higher layer is the proof that supports the idea in the lower layer. So A with an arrow to B means that concept A provides evidence for concept B. In the example here, we see that Sperling's partial report procedure helped provide us with evidence about the quantity and duration of visual sensory memory. As I mentioned earlier, as we get in the habit of using concept mapping while creating our study notes, it becomes a more efficient way to quickly represent additional layers of information in our notes. Because when we start digging into the course material, the concepts and our study notes can start to get quite detailed. Concept maps can help streamline and organize our study notes. But this also helps us because it reminds us to focus on the nature of the relationships between the ideas we are studying. When we were discussing the study by Leopold and Lutner, we noted their results show that concept mapping was an effective strategy, but so was a visualizing strategy, which involves translating the written text into a pictorial or graphic format. The key with this sort of study strategy is that it gets us to focus on what the idea is really about, because we have to figure out how to represent the idea in a drawing. 
But another part of the advantage is that it gets us away from just being focused on learning a specific set of words. I refer to this as being word locked, where we don't recognize the concept unless we see the exact wording that we had read in the textbook. Translating your study notes into graphic format gets you to really think about the essential nature of the idea because you're trying to figure out how to turn it into a drawing. Not only are you thinking about how to create a drawing that captures the nature of the concept, but in addition you are also incorporating the same sort of connections between ideas that we just talked about with concept mapping. The downside is that this can take a bit of extra time and it sort of helps if you don't suck at drawing. The key for either concept mapping or visualizing is that you are engaged in an effortful processing activity, really thinking about the nature of the concepts and the relationships between the concepts. And you are making meaning by building structure, creating graphics or writing in your own words. I want to give you a heads up about how to solve a possible risk associated with the use of concept maps. There is a risk that we may get over focused on the relationships between ideas at the expense of examining the elements that make each concept unique, acknowledging the differences between concepts. And if you're going to be writing a multiple choice exam, the task on that sort of exam is to identify the unique correct response. What makes a particular answer the correct response to the question? In doing this, you have to ask, how does this one differ from the other incorrect response options? Which means that when studying for a multiple choice exam, you need to understand the differences between concepts. Therefore, don't forget to incorporate into your study notes or concept map the factors that help differentiate each concept from the others. This brings me to the final key element for effective studying, which is to engage in retrieval while studying. Retrieval just means that we're bringing the idea back from memory into our conscious mind. Obviously, first the concept had to have been learned, we had to do our initial studying, but sometimes when we're studying, we learn a concept and we think we've got this. But just because you got it right once doesn't mean that you really have it mastered. And merely going back and rereading the material can cause a feeling of familiarity, leading to overconfidence. A key factor for successful studying is the process of retrieval, which is an active process where we are reconstructing an idea from memory. And not just I read it 10 seconds ago, but rather I read it last week. The research seems to indicate that incorporating any form of retrieval practice into our studying appears to be effective. But you can combine retrieval with concept mapping and recreate a concept map from memory. Okay, now that we're done, let's summarize what we've talked about and organize all of this information based on a timeline of when we would use these tactics. So first, before we start studying, we want to plan study time to allow for distributed learning. We want to remove distractors from our study space. And we want to read through the headings and look for the big picture so that we can see the overarching structure that connects the various sections. While we are reading and studying, we want to ensure that we are making study notes and writing them in our own words. We want to engage in metacognition, self-assessing to make sure we're on track. We want to be using concept mapping as part of our study notes. And we want to use the Pomodoro technique to help us maintain our focus while studying. After reading and making our study notes, we want to engage in more metacognition where we self-reflect on our comprehension and evaluate any problems that we may have encountered. And we want to engage in retrieval practice, testing our memory and understanding. Check out my web channel for other videos where we apply the science of learning to other areas of our schoolwork in order to maximize our academic success. Thanks for watching.